the second video in our materials section is about stress strain graphs and stress strain in particular. So first of all, you need to understand what stress is and why we need it. Well, if you want to design something that is structurally safe, you need to know what is going to happen to that material when you put it under stress. In other words, when you exert a force on it. And this is about materials rather than objects. So Hooke's law was all about particular objects, springs or pieces of wire. They have specific dimensions and you're looking at what happens when you stretch that object or you compress that object. Here we're talking about materials in general. So what stress is, is how much force a material will experience and how it is spread over that material's area. And this might sound familiar to you and you might think, well, that's exactly the same as pressure. And you'd be right, because it is the same as pressure and it's calculated in the same way. It is force divided by area. So it is the force per unit area. And remember, we can have both tensile and compressive forces, forces that stretch and forces that squash. Now, strain is the reaction to stress. And it tells you how much an object's shape will change when you put it under stress. And so, the strain is, it's given the little symbol epsilon like this, the change in length of an object over its original length. And that again can be either an increase in length if it's under tensile stress or a decrease in length if it's under compressive stress. Let's talk about the units for a moment. Obviously for stress, it's force over area and the unit is the Pascal, same as pressure. With strain, strain is a ratio. And you could see if you put numbers in here with their units, they would cancel. So that is a ratio, or it might be given as a percentage. Classically, you see stress strain represented like this on a graph as an example. And we're going to point out the things from this graph that you need to know. As you can see, we have a straight line section just as we had for Hooke's law. And so we have also our limit of proportionality, which we'll call point A. Shortly after the limit of proportionality, point B, where the material stops being elastic, will be its elastic limit. Just after the elastic limit, we have something called the yield point. Here it's called yield strength. Between the elastic limit and the yield point, the material goes plastic. And so once it hits the yield point, if you take the stress off, you're going to have a permanent strain, a permanent extension of the material. After the yield point, you can see the force or the stress here decreases and yet we're still getting extension. It is still moving along the x-axis. If you continue to apply force after that, you get very large extensions until you get to this point, sometimes called the UTS, the ultimate tensile strength. And after that, even as you unload, your material, you'll get this continuous extension, sometimes called necking. This is where the material gets, very, gets a very narrow point until our fracture stress or breaking stress out here. Our specification calls it the breaking stress. Fracture is equally good. You can see on this graph, this area here has been marked, the straight line area and the gradient. They're clearly calculating the gradient here. And the gradient here is obviously rise over run, and it gives you a quantity called the Young modulus. The Young modulus is given the symbol E, and so the Young modulus then is the stress divided by the strain. Because strain doesn't have a ratio, that means that the Young modulus is also in Pascals, but usually you see it given in gigapascals, so make sure that you know your prefixes. What about the area under this straight line section? Well, let's explore that for a moment. It's going to be a triangle, so we know it's going to be half the height times the base. And that's going to be half the stress times the strain. And if we substitute into that, we'll see that's half force over area times the change in length over the length. If we continue simplifying, we'll see we get half F delta X, just multiplying it out, over volume. And of course, we should know that F times delta X, that is the work done. And so the area under this straight line section then 
gives you the work done per unit volume. This graph is an example of the kind of thing that you can get, but there are all kinds. And so you have to be able to interpret these graphs. Look at the gradient. The gradient is going to tell you how much strain you get for the stress that you apply. So if you've got a very low gradient, that means that you get a lot of extension of your material for a small amount of force. And that would be something that is very easily pulled out, what we call ductile. Conversely, if you've got a very steep gradient at the start, for a large amount of force, you get very little extension. This would be a very stiff material. And if you look at an example here, this is the ductile material here. You get quite a lot of extension even after the material goes plastic. But this brittle material, you can see it's got quite a high gradient here, so a high young modulus, which means you get very little extension for the force applied, and it breaks very early. It doesn't have a plastic region, so it doesn't stretch as you add forces. Now again, remember that stress strain is a more general idea than Hooke's law. We meet this a lot at A-level. You look at resistivity when we look at electric circuits. And we also look at specific heat capacity when we look at thermodynamics. These are for materials as opposed to objects. At GCSE, we focused on objects. So Hooke's law is for particular springs. Resistance is the resistance of a piece of wire. And heat capacity would be the capacity of an object like a saucepan. And so at A level we move from being very specific about objects into applying our knowledge more generally across materials.